a public lecture to be delivered by the Vice Chancellor of the University of Benin. As I said, my sister, Professor Lillian Salama. And a book presentation by the Benson Idahosa University. These activities are in honor of the Chancellor of our great university and the Archbishop of the Church of God Mission International. His Grace Most Reverend, please a loud applause. <laughs> Margaret E. Benson Idahosa, JP OON. To mark her entrance to the class of octogenarians, Mama at 80. The title of today's lecture, Breaking the Glass Ceiling, is emblematic of the wars that the celebrant has fought and won. The cultures she has changed, the new dimension she has evolved, and the hopes she has created, especially for the female gender for whom she blazes an indelible trail. <laughs> Clearly, the Archbishop epitomizes courage dignity, resilience, and creative innovation. Through her life and works, we know that those who get to the top and remain there are superlative achievers who reach the zenith by shattering all glasses of limitations. I will leave the detailed encomiums on Mama for the able lecturer to do at the right time. But let me emphasize that Mama is the epitome of that class of great individuals. And this is affirmed and demonstrated by the Ganjuan Tuan book that this university has commissioned in honor of their most distinguished chancellor. This book, entitled Christianity and Society, Essays in Honor of Archbishop Margaret Benson Itahosa at 80, will debut today and be presented to the celebrant who is highly deserving of the honor done to her by the university and the authors of the 51 chapters of the volume. The book is over there. Beautiful book. Again, I restrain myself from letting the cat out of the bag. I reserve the details for the book reviewer, Professor Alexandra Esimaji who I believe will do justice to presenting the book to this eminent audience here today. I pause here to thank Mama for her support, not only to the university, but the College of Medicine, which fulfills the dream of the first chancellor, Papa, a dream which Mama worked assiduously to achieve in many ways. You see, my work is quite simple. I'm going to sit back like the rest of you and be in the euphoria of some of the achievements of our available, elegant, able chancellor and archbishop. So once again, I welcome to these historic, historic events as we mark the 80th birthday of our highly beloved Mama, Mama on behalf of Benson Idahosa University, and all our guests that here today, I say happy birthday to you, and God bless you.
Haleluya. Haleluya. Chancellor Ma. Happy birthday, mommy. Happy birthday. I know if God were to open your heart right now, what we will see in your heart is total praise to God. And so our song this morning is titled Total Praise. Ladies and gentlemen, the Benson Idahosa University Staff Choir. Put your hands together. <laughs> Yeah. 
Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for the Bensi Idahosa University Staff Choir. Emphasis on staff, staff choir. We are never in short supply of singers and musicians. Only recently, an ex student of Bensi Idahosa University won the Nigerian Idol. Such is the grace that follow each and every of our students that passes through Bensi Idahosa University. They become world changers and champions in their fields. Thank you very much. That choir is led by Reverend Emmanuel Awipi and Joshua Omorege. Thank you very much, the Bensi Idahosa University Choir. I'd like to recognize the Zonal Coordinator of Benin Zone 9, Reverend Philip Omorige Ugyakbe. You're welcome, sir. Thank you for being here. We have representing the Chancellor of Ibinadion University, who is the Esama of the Benin Kingdom. Honorable Charles Ibinadion, you're welcome, sir. You're welcome, sir. Thank you for being here. Chancellor, ma'am, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to respectfully at this juncture request the honor of our lecturer, Professor Lillian. Imwetinya Salami to kindly step forward. A round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. You, you may be seated. And I, I'd like to, at this juncture, also request the university orator, who himself is the director of part-time and sandwich programs of this university, Professor Mark Osamagbe Igile, to kindly read the citation of the lecturer and present the lecturer to us this morning. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Chancellor and Chief Celebrant, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please permit me to stand on the protocol already established as I present an abridged citation on the lecturer of the maiden edition of the Archbishop Margaret Benson Idahosa Public Lecture Series, Vice Chancellor of the University of Benin, Professor Lillian Imwetinya Salamin. In Proverbs chapter 31, 29 to 30 of the New Living Bible Translation, Scripture says, and I quote, there are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. And in addition to the Passion Translation, throughout eternity. Hallelujah. At least two interpretations can be deduced from the above scriptures. Number one, it is only someone with an excellent spirit that can be audacious in speaking on the personification of excellence and greatness. The second interpretation of the above scripture is that when a woman truly fears the Lord, 
charm and beauty become natural and permanent features of her greatness and excellence. Suffice to say at this point that the lecturer of today on the one hand and the chief celebrant of today, they are both testimonials and testament of the integrity of the above scriptures. Our lecturer who holds a BSc Home Economics, MSc Nutrition, both from Fargo, USA, PhD in Human Nutrition from the University of Nigeria, Unsuka, PGD from the University of Benin, and a postgraduate diploma, a postdoctoral from Virginia Park, South Africa, is fellow Nutrition Society of Nigeria and fellow International Federation of Home Economics and Home Economics Professional Association of Nigeria. <clears throat> Professor Lillian Salami has a vast teaching experience Ghana from several universities, such as Obafemi Awolowo University, University of Meduguri, and University of Benin. Our research and specialization areas include nutrient supplementation, overweight concerns, and management. She has been external examiner to over 10 universities, and several colleges of education in Nigeria and South Africa. Our distinguished lecturer for today has successfully supervised over 18 doctoral and more than 50 master's degree students in home economics slash nutrition. She has also assessed professorial candidates and principal tutors for many Nigerian universities and colleges of education, respectfully. Chancellor and Chief Celebrant, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, who can better pontificate in a lecture entitled Breaking the Glass Ceiling than our versatile lecturer who has served in words and deeds has broken the glass ceiling in many respects. Our speaker and lecturer today is indisputably a trailblazer who has broken through the garrison of different forms and limitations to become the star that she is today. For example, just to cite a few instances, she is the first female professor and first female dean of the Faculty of Education, University of Benin. She is the pioneer president of Hope Economics Teachers Association, Edo State. She is a pioneer member of the African Nutrition Leadership Program, South Africa. She is a steering member of Home Economic Council of Nigeria. She is the second female vice chancellor of the University of Berlin. She is the chairman committee of vice chancellors of Nigerian University and vice president Association of African Universities. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, that Professor Lillian Imwentinya Salami is the first lecturer in the Archbishop Margaret E. Bessini Daosa public lecture series in itself is an additional vindication and validation and a testimonial to the pioneering integrity and exploits of our lecturer today. Our esteemed 
The lecturer for today is a celebrated exponent. And borrowing the expression of my Vice Chancellor, Professor Sam Gobadia, the driver of the town and gown dynamics. <laughs> apart from the fact, apart from her very core assignment of university administration, teaching, research, and mentoring, she is also strategic to developmental strikes in the kingdom of Benin, where she is a serving member of Benin Forum, the advisory council to his royal majesty on Monoba Nedu, Ukua Bolo Bolo, Oba Eware the second, the Ogidigan and Oba of Benin Kingdom. Our distinguished lecturer today, Chancellor, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, has been greatly involved through conferences, workshops, and seminars in activities that help to advance in proper light the pride, dignity, and integrity of Benin women. Chancellor, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, standing before this esteemed audience to open up the womb of the AMDI public lecture series is the author of more than 85 peer-reviewed articles in learned journals and proceedings nationally and internationally the editor, co-editor, and consulting editor of several national and international journals, and a keynote speaker of global repute. It is now time to listen to the lecture. It is time to know the secrets of greatness. It is time to learn from the one who knows what it takes to get to the top and remain there. Please, if I'm not asking too much, with a standing ovation, join me to usher into this platform and cubicle of pontification and knowledge dissemination, the immediate part director general and Chief Executive of the National Institute for Educational Management and Administration Nigeria, a fantastic lover of sewing, baking, and traveling, an affectionate mother, and a celebrated grandmother, Vice Chancellor of the University of Benin, Professor Mrs. Lilian Imwetinya Salami. Thank you, Jesus. After that kind of introduction, I wish I could grow taller. But I think age will not allow it. And I say, I personalize it. This great woman, like they say, please sit down, please sit down. Thank you. This great woman, like they say, Emi no kwe mani do otoye. For those of you who are not Benin, get the dictionary and decipher what I have just said. This is a woman who will send messages to me from time to time and say, go on. We are behind you. We are praying for you. We are proud of you. Who else but my great mother? And that's why I personalize by saying, Domo Iyeme. Thank you very much, ma. My auntie is here. I'm from the Emova family, and we're well-bred, brought up to respect those that deserve respect. And my mom here today deserves respect. Thank you very much, ma'am. Permit me to respectfully acknowledge those that have been called by the protocol already established. 
I am sure we are all sitting here wanting to hear about all the experiences haven't gone through or, uh, you know, sitting on a position that otherwise, you know, it belongs to the men. Not exclusively, because I am the second female after 35 years of our great mother of blessed memory, Grace Alele Williams. So it tells you that seven vice chancellors had come in between before somebody thought of, let a woman do it again. And of course, here I am. So, thank you again, my mother, and then, of course, the organizers for seeing that I can be one who would actually say great privilege. In fact, I was saying to Mama, uh, Mommy, this morning, I said, who else could have taken this topic but for you? You would have been the best to really take this. But it isn't easy for you to be a judge in your own court. And so somebody else had to. So I, I want to most profoundly and sincerely express my gratitude to members of the planning committee of the 80th birthday anniversary celebration of an icon, an Amazon, a colossus of our time, Archbishop Margaret Benson Idaosa, J-P-O-O-N, for considering me worthy to deliver a keynote address on this topical topic, breaking the glass ceiling, women in leadership. This issue is not just timely, but appropriate, especially for two reasons. Firstly, women remain the unsung heroes, incubators, developers, innovators, and propellers of national integration and development. Secondly, and most importantly, of course, is that it marks, it is an honor to our celebrant who has not only broken the glass ceiling, but has shattered it. A woman who has grasped the mantle of leadership in a male-dominated arena, very successfully for that matter. A woman who has recorded exploits in her ministry, an aspiration to future generations of women, a woman with beauty and divine grace. The first female archbishop in Africa, the first female chancellor, and the first female proprietress of education institution at all levels of the education ecosystem. Who? Archbishop Margaret Benson Idaosa, J-P-O-O-N. Women have remained underrepresented in many fairs of life with numerous social and cultural constraints, including patriarchy and the organization of production and reproductive members, among others. Women have taught and fought for their rights and have stood their ground. The good news is that, to some extent, they have made progress in breaking into leadership. But a real dramatic breaking of the glass ceiling has not yet occurred. While some other countries have reached greater parity in terms of women's presence, Nigeria still lags behind in international efforts to promote gender equality. This paper will give an overview of the context, uh, concept of glass breaking and leadership. The paper will illustrate the issues of women and leadership, Nigerian policy situation and gender parity, and the global efforts of several Nigerian women at breaking several glass ceilings. This paper will also discuss the various strategies and supports required to gear up women to the challenge for leadership positions in our society and the roles they themselves should play if they intend to continually break the several glass ceiling 
that abounds in this male dominated world. Now, what is that that we all call the glass ceiling? Glass ceiling was first used in 1978 by Menro Loden, a management consultant, an author, and champion of diversity to express the impassable impediments that kept women from pursuing career advancement and growth. It refers to the concept of women overcoming barriers, both visible and invisible, that obstruct and prevent them from reaching top leadership positions in organizations dominated by men. This hindrance, which, which is often systematic and formidable, may include but not exclusive to gender stereotyping, gender bias, violence, discriminatory practices, balancing work and family responsibilities, cultural and social norms, and limited assets to education, resources, and opportunities. The glass ceiling is therefore a symbolic description of the gender disparity prevalence in many organizations where qualified and talented women encounter innumerable and avoidable obstacles in their path of progress, despite their qualification, skills, and ambition. However, women's perseverance, tenacity, and diversified talents have led to progress in recent times. The glass ceiling is not an impenetrable barrier as numerous women have shattered it, proving that gender should not be a limitation to attaining leadership roles. There is also an addition to the word ceiling, which is the glass cliff. The glass cliff permits women to enter certain position at a cost. They are given leadership positions during times of organizational crisis, such as bankruptcy, scandal, and re recession, amongst others, which is outright setting up the women to fail. Now, let us look at leadership. Leadership is the ability of an individual or a group of persons in an organization or a society to influence and guide followers or members in such an organization or society or team to achieve the collective goals of the organizations uh, uh, of the organization or society. A leader, therefore, is that person, irrespective of gender, that is able to galvanize the human and material resources available to him or her to pursue the organizational vision and mission to achieve the stated objective. Leadership can be natural entrusted and attained. Some persons are born with innate qualities that predispose them to, the, to be leaders, while others not naturally gifted with leadership ability can actually acquire such. All leaders, born or made, can improve their ability with the desire, experience, and effort, which is not limited to a particular gender. There are different types of leadership, autocratic, authoritative, transformational, or the less affair amongst others, women and leadership. No doubt that in recent times, there has been a paradigm shift in the gender dynamics within leadership roles. More women are taking up executive positions serving as chief executive officers in business organization, educational institution, and leaders in political and relig religious organizations. Women can be as effective as their male counterparts, if not even better, in leadership qualities. Women can be more efficient in resources, utilization, and management. This is not surprising because a woman 
has an innate ability to dream big. A woman can challenge assumptions and inspires teams. A woman can easily translate big ideas into concrete, actionable results. A women are empathetic and flexible. Women are stronger with interpersonal skills, with inclusive open leadership points. Empowering women to hold leadership position has been transformational, has transformational benefit to any or uh, on any organization. This is so because women demonstrate a more transformational leadership style when compared to their male counterparts. Women are more likely to personify the organization's best qualities and encourage others to support its mission. They are now perceived to be more intelligent and honest with higher levels of integrity, accessibility, social ability, and creativity. Women can study more minor details, hence bringing more diverse views and a sense of awareness. Women leaders increase productivity, enhance collaboration, inspire organization dedication, and improve fairness. They can easily unify diverse groups, symbolizing unity and cooperation, thus improving interpersonal relationship in organizations with their feminist charm. Nigeria as a member of the United Nations has no doubt put in place all the necessary mechanisms needed to eliminate gender discrimination and ensure equality and human dignity to all men and women. The national gender policy has been formulated in Nigeria since 2006. The policy demands that 35% of women be involved in all governance processes. In 2022, a federal high court in Abuja ordered the federal government to comply with the Beijing de Declaration of 35% affirmative action on women. This is a huge effort to promote women's participation in governance through policy measures and guidelines. Arising, therefore, there are many relevant initiatives by international agencies and governments uh, and Nigerian government. For example, there is the policy on national agenda. These seeks to promote quality and women empowerment in various sectors, including governance. It encourages political parties to comply with affirmative action in their party structures to increase women's representative in decision-making positions. There is a second national gender plan for action. This is a strategic framework that aims to promote gender mainstreaming in all sectors of the Nigerian society. It provides guidelines for enhancing women's participation and representation in government and decision making. There is gender and equal opportunity bill. This bill, which was introduced in the Nigerian Senate in 2010, seeks to eliminate all forms of discrimination against women. If passed into law, it should promote women's participation in politics and governance, among others. And the last one is the state-level initiative. Many states of the Federation have started working towards the implementation of the 35% affirmative action in favor of female representation in political position distribution. Not the less, nonetheless, much is still expected from the national political leadership to exhibit greater political will to allow women to participate in the development of this great nation. Take a woman president and the story will change.
with the sole purpose of achieving gender equality, Nigerian women have been rewriting the history of women in Nigeria and around the world for many years. Their contributions are driving positive change and inspiring future generations in every field of endeavor. They have excelled in political leadership, business and entrepreneurship, education and academics, civil society activities, and cultural and artistic leadership. Notably amongst them are Dr. Ungozi Okonjo Iwela, who is the Director General of the World Trade Organization, Dr. Obiageli Ekwesili, who is an author of economic policy, Senator Desi Ehanire Danjima, a seasoned politician, a business magnum, and a philanthropist. Mrs. Betty Obaseki, a Doste Fox lady, a seasoned technocrat, politician, and a philanthropist. Dr. Dere Awoshika, a medical personnel and a bank CEO. Professor Ronke Omoregbe, who is the first son and educationist. Evangelist Margaret Agbonifo, a church leader and a philanthropist. Justice Constance Momo, a great luminary in law and philanthropist. For Lonsha Alakija, the Nigerian billionaire and philanthropist. She is the founder and group managing director of the Rose of Sharon Group. Ibuku Awoshika, who is an author, a businesswoman, and a philanthropist. Dr. Chinamadu Aditi, who is a renowned award winning writer and a feminist. Amina J. Mohammed, who is currently serving as the United Nations Deputy Secretary General. Uh, Bo, who is also a philanthropist and a media mogul. She is the CEO of Ebony Light TV, an African most successful woman, according to Forbes. Aisha Yusuf is both an activist and entrepreneur a prominent founder of the NSAS movement and the founder of the Bring Back Our Girls Initiative. Adobe Sandra Ijeoma, an entrepreneur in advanced products in health sector. Olufu Nke Olubomi a philanthropist. Stella Adebayo, a technology guru. Olulade Adenika is an aviation entrepreneur. Ungozi Onoju, an entrepreneur and a teacher, amongst many, many others. To so of course mention that several female vice chancellors of universities in Nigeria, including my own self, a position previously dead by women. Kudos to the trailblazers in this category, the late Professor Grace Alele Williams of blessed memory. Now, what are some of the strategies get, that can be placed in breaking the glass ceiling by women? Despite the achievement of some of these women or numerous women, African women still face numerous challenges in attaining leadership position. Gender bias, low financial capability, cultural and traditional biases, child rearing and nurturing gender stereotype are some of the numerous challenges. However, there are several strategies and approaches that women must adopt to enable them to shatter the glass ceiling, not just to break the glass ceiling. One is to build a strong professional network. Networking is crucial for career advancement. Women can actively participate in professional organizations, attend conferences, and connect with mentors and role models who can offer guidance and support. Building a diverse network 
can provide access to, uh, to opportunities, increase visibility, and open doors to leadership positions. We also must seek our mentors and sponsors. Mentors and sponsors can provide valuable guidance, advice, and advocacy. Look for individuals, both men and women, who have experience in leadership positions and are willing to support and advance for our advancement's sake. Their insight and support can help navigate challenges and provide valuable opportunities for growth. Invest in continuous learning and skill development. Women should enhance their knowledge and skills through professional development programs, workshops, certification, and courses. Acquiring new skills and staying up to date with industry trends can make you more competitive and boost your confidence as a leader. Develop and showcase leadership qualities. Women should cultivate leadership qualities such as self-confidence, effective communication, decision-making, and problem-solving skills. They should seek out opportunities to take on leadership roles within their organization, volunteer for projects, or initiate their own projects, demonstrating your leadership poise or abilities can build credibility and increase your chances of being considered for high level positions. Challenge gender biases and stereotyping. Be aware of and challenge gender biases and stereotyping in workplace. It is not only women who should be secretaries. Men should also be secretaries. Actively address instances of bias and discrimination and advocate for inclusive policies and practices. By promoting gender equality and creating an inclusive environment, you contribute to breaking down barriers for yourself and other women. Find work-life balance and support systems. Balancing personal and professional responsibilities can be demanding, of course. Women should seek support from family, friends, and colleagues to create a support system that allows them to manage their commitments effectively. Negotiate flexible work arrangement when possible to accommodate personal needs and maintain a healthy work-life balance. Take risk. Without risk, there is no success. And seize opportunities. Women should be willing to step out of their comfort zone and take on new challenges. Pursue growth opportunities, such as cross-functional projects, international assignments, or leadership training programs. Enhance calculated risk and use setbacks as learning experiences to grow and develop as a leader. Advocate for yourself and others. Speak up and actively advocate for your achievement, skills, and contribution. Ensure you, your work is recognized and visible to decision makers within your organization and outside. Additionally, Support and advocate for other women in the workplace, creating a supportive environment that uplifts and promotes gender equality. Be resilient and persevere. Breaking the glass ceiling may not happen overnight, trust me. Persistence, resilience, and a possible mindset are essential. Overcome setbacks and learn from challenges along the way. Celebrate your successes, no matter how small they are, and remain focused on your long-term goals. Women must continue to believe in themselves that there is no shortcut to success in life. Beauty is transient. 
but enduring qualities are more than likely to continue to place women in leadership position. When you are blessed with beauty and brain, as yours truly, of course, the sky is your limit. Women should strive to exclude the following qualities for them to be glass breakers and shatterers. Such qualities must not be limited to the following, but these are some of them. Practicing resilience, exhibiting humility, playing to strengths and not emphasizing weaknesses. Oh, you know she's a woman, she can't do it. Be, the, be of service to others. Dare to take risks. Finding mentors. Never comparing yourself to others. We are made differently. Demonstrating strength with grace and poise and kindness. Godliness and be prayerful. With these, the sky will be the limit. Will, will not be the limit as all glass ceilings will not only be broken, but will be shattered. Helping women to break the glass at, in, in your workplace, in light of the challenges that women encounter in advancing their careers, employers of labor and government, should support women in general and professional women in the following ways. To attain the position of leadership, to express their God-given potentials. Improve, uh, imp uh, uh, implement scholarship and mentorship programs with your senior leaders. Women can be greatly aided in achieving leadership position by sponsoring and mentorship, especially from powerful men. Mentoring the up and upcoming women executives, sometimes referred to as the he for she can assist them in maximizing the business world. Introduce them to new prospects and aid them to remove gender obstacles that have historically prevented women from advancing. And not a transparent and robust recruitment process. Career process rely heavily on recommendation and referral, but all too frequent Women are left out of this pro process in favor of the old boys networks. This is when men in position of authority primarily pursue the interests of their long-term male co-workers and acquaintances. Employers can get around this by pushing the men in authority to recommend more women to advance their careers and provide them with new chances. Addressing the child care and family needs. This can sometimes be hard on women, as millions of women professionally have struggled to balance work, child care, and family needs. This, in no turn, can negatively impact the career prospects of millions of women, causing many to delay their career advancement goals or even drop out of workforce essentially to focus on child care and needy of their families. Employers can show some level of empathy and allyship by offering child care assistance, flexible family leave policies, and other policies designed to give women the freedom they need to both achieve to be effective at work and at home, to create a balance and successfully advance their career paths. They can develop policies and processes to fight bias and discrimination. Institutional biases and gender discrimination have hindered women's career progression objectively for far too long. By developing and strictly enforcing rules and regulation intended to combat gender biases and discrimination in the workplace, employers must take action to remedy this. Hold training sessions and workshops. Invite outside professionals to lead seminars and trainings on gender equity promotion 
and overcoming biases and discrimination against women in the workplace. The entire team will be able to understand the difficulties the glass ceiling prevents or presents and contribute to helping women smash it to pieces this way. Join the empowerment movement today. Women have made enormous progress in recent years in shuttling the glass ceiling. But eyelashes from employers and association is essential to combat prejudice, discrimination, and historical underpresentation in positions of power. By combining mentorship and comprehensive and transparent hiring processes, proper child care help, procedures and regulations that may successfully combat gender biases and discrimination, as well as other reforms, employers and associations can take the lead by attaining fairness in the workplace. Set goals and monitor progress closely. Women should set specific objectives and keep a careful eye on their progress. If they are not doing enough, they should think about enlisting the aid of outside groups and experts to explore what their companies or organizations can do to step up the efforts to empower women. Change the culture. Finally, employers should take a thorough look at the culture of their companies or organizations. Are there enough women in position of leadership? Can they do enough in advancing gender equality? Does everyone have the voice equally? Employers may implement the cultural adjustment required to support women in advancing their careers and breaking down barriers to take on new leadership roles by posing these challenging questions and conducting a critical evaluation of their organization and association. Oh, the one on Mama, where is it? Sorry, <laughs> because I have a session on the celebrant today. the life again like I said if we take on my mother's achievement it will become another inaugural lecture so I have tried as much as possible to reduce and just give an overview of who this great Amazon of our time is the icon the colossus in fact I'm lost with the adjective to actually Describe this great woman. Come on, Shema, this is so embarrassing. Oh, 
this is a tribute to my mother, Archbishop Margaret Benson Idaosa, J-P-O-O-N. A first among firsts. Her list of firsts is unending. The first woman bishop and the first female archbishop in Africa. She pilots the affairs of the Church of God, Church of God Mission International, with thousands of branches across Africa, Europe, North America, and Asia. The first female chancellor of an African university. She is lauded as one of the most influential preacher in Africa, whose impact is felt worldwide. Apart from being a wife to the late Archbishop Benson Idaosa, who still dates, who till date is known as the father of Pentecostals, her bravery has paved the way far for other women to be crowned titles beyond his party. 21 years have crept by and Archbishop Margaret Benson Idaosa still upholds the remarkable vision and exhibits uncommon wisdom in piloting the affairs of the ministry. She has exemplary leadership qualities. She is seen as a pace setter to women of younger ages who may be called to handle any sensitive position, whether political, spiritual, social, or otherwise. It is no doubt that Archbishop has her footprints in the sand of time through her incomparable achievements in the Church of God Mission International. With God's grace, the ministry is still stabilized. After decades of its establishment, and it is one of the churches that, are, that is promulgating peace nationwide. Under her administration, the church boasts of over 4,000 branches across Nigeria with a 20,000 capacity auditorium called the Faith Arena, as well as the international headquarters of the church located in Benin. There is also a massive church camp that serves as an outreach to lost souls. She has led so many crusades along the globe in attempt to win souls for Christ and also instills godly principles in people. Through her love for education, she has constituted more than 108 schools of the World of Faith schools, which involves kindergarten, primary, and secondary education all over Nigeria. She is the driving force behind the International Leadership Resource Institute, which was founded to instruct pastors and other types of leaders and church workers in leadership ethics and principle. The renowned evangelists also established an orphanage called My Sister's Place. She serves as both the executive president of All Nations for Christ Bible Institute and the chancellor of Benson Idahosa University, which offers degrees, degree programs to both national and international students. As an author, Archbishop Margaret Idahosa has the following books, amongst others, in print. The Womb of Harvest, The Female Minister, Tearing the veil, go for it, empowered for radical, radical change, season of harvest, and born naked, not empty. Even at 80, she remains as vibrant and gorgeous as the lady in her young age. It is no doubt that she has lived a fulfilled life due to her impact in Nigeria and the world at large. Without doubt, she has broken the glass ceiling in many spheres. Hence, she has been honored by the Federal Republic of Nigeria with a national award by the university uh, uh, honoring her with a national award. And the great University of Benin has also honored her 
with a doctorate degree and a justice of peace recognition by Edo State. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, may I quickly conclude my While some progress have been made, breaking the glass ceiling and achieving gender equality in leadership, roles remain an emerging challenge. It requires concerted efforts from women themselves, organization and government, and society in general. It is my candid view that there are many women out there in society waiting eagerly to shatter the glass ceiling but they have not been because they only need little push and that push can be from one of us seated here today i salute you my darling mother on your 80th birthday celebration my sincerest prayer is that god will continue to keep you in good health mind and body as you continue to shatter more glass ceilings and serve as a mentor and role model to women in our generation and even those yet unborn may the good lord almighty whom you serve continue to energize you as you march on into so many years into hundreds into above hundreds and that is my sincere prayers for you my darling mother Thank you very much. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you for those wonderful, wonderful words. Please, you, you, you. Yes, please. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. We'll invite... Yes. We invite the president and the vice chancellor to kindly step up. In summary, Mama is the epitome of breaking glass ceilings. Thank you very much. Please, yes, thank you. Oh, what can I say? Um, in the old days, you will hear what a man can do, women can also do. Men, let us take comfort in the fact that after this lecture, what a woman can do. <laughs> A man cannot do. It is not only men that should be bricklayers, women should also be bricklayers. Okay. Um, on behalf of the Chancellor of our great university, the President of our university, the Governing Council, the Senate management staff and students of Benson Idahosa University, it is my pleasure this afternoon, my dear sister and colleague, to bestow upon you this medal as the first lecturer in the Margaret Benson Itahosa University Public Lecture Series. Congratulations. Thank you very much for truly being a trailblazer, for not just saying it, but actually showing it. For that, we appreciate you and we say thank you. Here's a plaque 
on behalf of Benton Idahosa University to Professor Lilian Imorti and Salami, distinguished lecturer, Archbishop Margaret E. Benton Idahosa Public Lecture, Breaking the Glass Ceiling. Thank you so much. We appreciate you, Benton Idahosa University. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. You may be you may be seated. Thank you very much. I like to once again recognize the presence of one of the dignitaries to this event, representing the Chancellor of Igbinadion University, we have his son, Honorable Charles Igbinadion. You're welcome, sir. Thank you for being here. I'd like to inform us that there will be a cocktail after this event. Only those who are invited. If you don't get a cocktail card, please do well to stay away. Only those who are giving the card will know where. <laughs> Thank you very much. The Ben C. Dahosa University Staff Choir. Just one number, please. One. Okay, okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Slight modification. Thank you. Ever ready choir. Thank you very much. At this juncture, ladies and gentlemen. With the kind permission of the President and the Vice-Chancellor, I'd like to respectfully invite for the book presentation, Professor Alexandra Isimaje. Please, let's put our hands together as we receive her for the book presentation. I want to believe that the registrar gave a very robust protocol and that you would prefer that I do not repeat that protocol. And so I take permission from you to continue without doing the protocol. We are about to do something that is very historic, something that gives me great pleasure. Two days ago, when these books arrived from Berlin, the capital of Germany, I understood how God felt on the last day of creation. <laughs> I also understood why he had to rest the next day. I want to tell you that from December, when the idea of honoring our chancellor with this book came, this month is the eighth month. You will agree with me that no ordinary book of this size and magnitude can be produced in eight months. And that is why I say that I'm very, very grateful. Mama, this is a promise fulfilled. It is. 
My job here is to tell you about this book. I will begin by telling you that this book is a fresh street. A fresh street, that's a German word, is a book that you write in honor of someone who is notable in society. It's a book that you write based on the ideas or ideals of such a person. It is a book that you write in honor of someone that society cannot ignore. And then you want to document what is written in the book. You want to ensure that you leave a legacy which will outlive and outlive and outlive generations of people who know that person and those that will know him or her from that book. From all the encomiums that the guest lecturer has given on Mama, you will agree again with me that she is deserving of this honor. The book is titled Christianity and Society. Essays in honor of Archbishop Margaret Benson Edahosa at 80. That's the title of this book. As we speak, this book is in databases and universities across Europe because it was first published online on the 28th of June and put in all these libraries online as well. But you are privileged to cite the physical copy. The book has 751 pages. It has four editors, as you will see when you touch it, but I'll tell you. Four editors. We have a Simaji, as is written on the book, Eda Hosa, Gobadier, and Van Rui as editors of this book, which is two days old here. You don't want to clap? <laughs> All right. Now, let me tell you about this book. In the blob of the book, we read that religion is entrenched in the Nigerian culture and worshippers constitute a major social group. But at the same time, religion is a major cankerworm in Nigeria alongside corruption and poses a clear threat to the peace and unity of the nation. There are increasing cases of inter-religious wars that polarize the Nigerian society. As such, religious sermons become avenues of social and political mobilization, avenues of awareness creation, and a tool of conflict consolidation or resolution, depending on what you want to do with it. Today, churches proliferate and their members number in multiples of millions all over the world. Nigeria has a substantial number of these worshippers whose eyes are literally raised to their God daily. It is therefore not a surprise that the church now plays an expanded role. It finds itself taking on the role of government in many ways to justify its message that God is almighty and that he is all sufficient. So the church now occupies an apex position in constructing social, economic, political, and cultural frameworks for nation building. It is this expanded role of the Church of Christ in society that this book seeks to codify as well as 
promotes. In the foreword to the book, which was written by Archbishop Kirby Clements, he called Christianity a gospel of influence, noting that this influence is exerted through knowledge and understanding of the purposes, priorities, and perspective of divine authority. He cites Dr. Alvin Mitch Schmidt when he said, How Christianity Changed the World. Who wrote How Christianity Changed the World? To prove the massive impact of Christianity on the world. How Christianity teachings advance science, create concepts of the political, social, and economic freedom. How Christianity fosters justice and provided inspiration for great achievements in architecture, in art, in music, in literature, and even science. A list of some of the areas of influence which he leads are freedom and dignity of women, institutions of charity and compassion, such as orphanages, hospitals and mental institutions, compulsory education and tax-supported schools, etc., etc. So that gives us a background. Now, the book is made up of 51 chapters contributed by almost 80 authors drawn from over 20 universities and institutions across the country. Part one of the book presents canon canonical characteristics of the Archbishop Dr. Mrs. Margaret Benson Idahosa, who is the epitome of Christianity in this context and in whose honor the book is written. In this part, seven authors, Kebi Clements, Osasu Isibo, Wale Ajayi, Festo Sahime, Alex Idu, Tari Ekiyo, and Egosa Igumbo, all present perspectives on her eminence, the Archbishop Dr. Mrs. Margaret Benson Idahosa the enigmatic leader of the renowned Church of God Mission International, the first female archbishop, you have been told this, and the chancellor of the first Christian university in Nigeria. Now, drawing from their crucibles of knowledge about the archbishop, whether through relationship or through perception, each author presents their personal views of the person of Dr. Margaret Benson Idahosa which when taken holistically provide an overarching picture of one who is the epitome of Christianity. In the chapter, for instance, Archbishop Kirby Clement describes Archbishop Margaret as a pioneer and a standard for strength, for courage, for compassion and endurance in Christendom. And Dr. Sasu Isibo, in his expose, which is titled Call me Brother Idahosa for one hour. Defines Mama as that spiritual enigma whom God has raised as the avant-garde of women in ministry. And Bishop Wale Ajayi describes his personal sonship experience and how Mama taught him the life lessons of identity, provision, and power. Bishop Festus Ahimia, who for many years was administrator of the Word of Faith schools established by the Archbishop, describes her passion for Christian education. And commenting on her meteoric success in ministry, Alex Edu described the Archbishop as one with the proverbial middle torch, because everything that she has touched, whether in ministry or in business, turned to gold. Reverend Tari Akio gives an insightful account of his unique encounter with the Archbishop who beckoned on him from a crowd to ask the profound question, have you eaten? To underline her willingness to give of herself for the better, betterment of others. And finally, in that chapter, Reverend Egosa Igumbo completes the chapter by providing an insider perspective on the Archbishop whose passion for people he describes as being deeper than a bottomless well. Clap for the Archbishop.
And then in part two, we have 35 chapters. We have 35 chapters in part two. And all these chapters discuss the various applications of Christianity in the multifarious facets of the lives of people. In these chapters, nine of the chapters relate Christianity to society through the linguistic lenses in order to show how language plays a key role in Christian communication. Six of the chapters deal with the relationship of biblical messages to specific aspects of society, to the environment, relationships, morality, health, healthy living, and traditional medicine. Another six chapters present rich discourses on the relationship of the media to the achievement of the objectives of Christianity, the utility of information and communication technologies we are fully discussed. The issue of gender in the Bible was the preoccupation of five chapters. Two other chapters drew attention to government policies and practices that are inimical to the health of the church and which must be tackled to forestall religious crisis. The remaining three chapters in this section present historical and informational accounts that help us to understand the subject of Christianity and how this information is documented and sustained. In part three, 15 chapters portray the direct relationships of Christianity to the key sectors of society, namely economy, health, education, international diplomacy, social change, science, and culture. In one of these chapters, the author argues that interconnectivity between Christianity and economics is inseparable and points out that the creation of the earth was a process of economic execution by God. I don't know about this, but I'm sure that the vice chancellor as an economist will understand what he's saying. In four chapters, another four chapters, authors make various attempts to argue that Christians are entitled to health and healing. They discuss the cause and effect of sickness and diseases on humans. One of the authors of these chapters is here, Professor Yahweh himself, who wrote on how the scriptures can lead us to good health. They also extract the possible remedies obtainable from the Christian perspective to further buttress God's will, that God's will for man has always been to live in perfect health. Education is another sector that benefited from the advent of Christianity. And we find this relationship explored in three chapters of this book, which provide a historical narrative of how Christianity came into Nigeria, its influence on the growth of education, the era of government takeover of church, of uh, the era of government takeover of church schools, and its effect on education. In chapters 25 to 50, the social responsibilities of the church and their role in effecting social change were richly discussed and illustrated. The last chapter, chapter 51, described the utility of Christianity in interfaith diplomacy in the current global political system and how it can better promote peace and build bridges across conflicting religious divides. Now, the summary of this book is that the Christian church is a major pillar of the Nigerian society and that through its multiple interventions in education, health, media, social, culture, and transformation, transformational initiatives, the church has proved to be an indispensable part of the government of Nigeria. Such influence is symbolized in the person of the Archbishop Margaret Benson Idahosa. Truly, as one of the authors stated, the life of Archbishop Margaret Benson Idahosa is a testament to the impact and influence of the church in the Nigerian society. As a prominent Christian leader and touch bearer of the Church of God Mission International, Archbishop Ada Hosa's influence has extended far beyond the walls of the church. Her work in various fields, including education, medical missions, 
and social justice initiatives has left a profound and lasting impact on society. So she exemplifies what it means to be a strong woman in leadership. <laughs> One who has shattered glass ceilings and blazed a trail for future generations. This is according to Tari Akio. But Archbishop Clements reiterated this point when he said that in every generation, there are individuals and groups, politicians, there are individuals and groups that emerge and greatly influence their world and even a global audience. Some of them are scientists, politicians, entertainers, social activists, and even athletes who draw attention to global issues such as poverty, fear, war, discrimination, and the need for reconciliation, peace, harmony, love, race, gender, and nationality. Their life, presence, and work seem to reach beyond themselves and their geographic region. At times, the initiation of such mission is a crisis. And so it is with the Archbishop Margaret Benson Edahosa. It is therefore for these reasons that this book was written, to document the ideals and ideas that the Archbishop Margaret Benson Idahosa stands for, and to present the legacy of the Church of God, Church of Christ to humanity. And in my opinion, the book achieved its objectives. So this is the time to present this book to the person in whose honor it was written. I would like to invite the Vice Chancellor and the President who are co-editors with me to join me as we do this presentation. Mama, you're coming forward. All right. Okay. So, Mama, this book is your book. This is the book. Yes. This is the book that will tell the story of who you are to the rest of the world. Like I said, even those who didn't have the opportunity to meet you physically will meet you through this book. All the things we have said are in this book. Almost 80 persons sat down to say yes, we will honor her in this way. So on behalf of the Benson Edahosa University, on behalf of the president, Faith Emmanuel Benson, who is one of the editors, and on behalf of the vice chancellor, Professor Sam Gobadia, and the fourth editor who is not here, he's in Amsterdam, I'd like to present this book to you and to say thank you, ma'am, for giving us the opportunity to honor you.
Praise the Lord. Please, paparazzis, please give way. Praise the Lord. I, uh, I don't know how I feel this afternoon. I feel elated and The president of Benson Idahota University, the vice chancellor, and my amiable, excellent, brilliant. The Vice Chancellor of the University of Benin. My darling friend, Professor Salam. The Deputy Vice Chancellor. And the representative of Olu Wari Ogiame. And all our men and women that are here, I can't mention your name one by one, but I want you to know that for the very reason that you are in this hall, you are very, very significant and important. And I want to thank you immensely for this that have been done. You know, I have learned from Professor Yahweh that each time you are coming to the presence of those that are there before you, you don't come empty and then you come with your paper. You come with your points. Especially when you are in a university community or environment. I have something that I have written here. Just to let you know. But it's just a small piece. But I want you to know that what is inside of me is more than this pieces that are put together. I want to say categorically that I am alive and well <laughs> to hear all these that have been put on me to the glory of God. That is why I am elated above every other thing. You know, I know of people that lived very well and died. And after their death, people begin to tell the impact that their lives have meant to people. 
But I'm most grateful unto the Lord Jesus Christ that has called me and put me in position to do the little I'm able to do from my corner. And that God has put it in the heart of people to publish it. I know, I know very well that I'm a global woman. But I never knew that people are watching. I am overwhelmed by the book presented to me today. How is it that the work that I do in my humble corner and in the church in Bini City that is a small dot in Nigeria is published for a wide for a, a far and wide such as to be presented to an array of academicians or academics that are here today. It is published Far and wide, so that some persons conceived the idea to honor me and to present me as a model of Christianity. Who am I? But a child of the living God. Let me just say a little thing about myself. When Archbishop Basin Idahosa passed, and I was suddenly put in position, I went to God and I said, God, I don't know why you have done this to me. Knowing fully well that I live in a mass world. I've never heard of a woman called Bishop or Archbishop. Never. The best thing I've heard about a woman in religious society is to be able to sing a good song and stand behind the organ to sing to a congregation. And I was quarreling with God. But after I quarreled, I cried and I apologized, I repented. And I took time off. And I said, Father, I want you to speak to me. You have always does. For two weeks, I was out of this country. I didn't hear a word. And I said, hey, this is it. Who will believe my report? One early morning, after I prayed, I went to the shower. And I, as water was just dripping on my head. And I heard a voice. Margaret, if I make the appointment, I will release the ability to perform. I looked behind me. Nobody was there. So I cleaned my water from my face, ran out of the bathroom, straight if somebody was in there. Nobody was there. It was then it dawned on me that that must be the voice of God. And I said to myself, all right, God, if you make the appointment, if you choose or call, you will release the ability to perform. Father, I am ready. Do whatever you want to do with me. And I came home rejoicing. And I thanked the Lord for all that 
he did. And I started working in my small little corner. In the Ministry of Church of God Mission, we have professors. One of them is the one that God has put in her heart to say, we will not let this thing go by at 80. Professor Mrs. Estimante, I want to forever be grateful to you. Forever be grateful to you. And wherever this book is read in the whole world, your name will be in there. I didn't write it, but God put it in your heart. And you approach many, and they say, okay, yeah, 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 we know her. Let's tell you what we know about her. And you did. You printed it not in Nigeria, but outside Nigeria. I want to say a big thank you to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I want to also thank the university, Benson Idahosa University, for honoring me for this my 80th birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Gobadia, thank you very, very much. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again. Uh, we have been here for a while now. I have a lot. It's, it's not long, short, but it's a little bit long. I, I think that's all that I want to say now. But I want you to believe with me that Professor Mrs. Salami has expatiated the role of women in leadership. If you are called to be a leader, if you are appointed to be a leader as a woman, don't shy away. You see, I'm going to get the, the speech, and I'm going to teach around the world with that speech. Amen. God spoke to me and said, Margaret, I am not gender specific. If you are ready, I am ready. And I said, God, I put my shoes on, and I'm ready to run with you. I have not finished yet. God has not finished with me yet. Amen. And uh, I want to take permission from the president and uh, Reverend Ekio that this book will also be presented during our global convention. It is already global, but our people need to know, need to see it. Want to thank all of you that came this afternoon to come and honor an individual. It's, this is history. This is history. And I'm very, very happy about it. Once again, Mrs. Esimaje, our professor, I thank you very, very much. And all those that have contributed, Professor Yahweh, I thank you very, very much for all that you mean to me, the family, and Church of God mission. We have always respected you when we keep respecting and honoring you. In Jesus' name. And um, the, the noble chiefs that have come to represent the Atuashe Olu of Wari, Ogame! Hallelujah! Uh, I want to please ask that you come and take one of the books to. Uh, a two-a-shade.
Deo guíame O lo of worry Please give them a round of applause as they come Oh, I'm sorry what? I'm, I'm, I'm out of order you know, this is university community. No, you're uh, uh, you order. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. No, this one, this one. Yeah, that's uh, right there. I'm based in Lahusa University. I present this to you. This is the first volume. I know that others are coming. Please. Thank you. And to worry kingdom. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> oh yes, so Chief Vic Benedio has launched the book for one million. One million dollars. <laughs> okay, love you. <laughs> okay. Wait, give me one more one of So okay. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our Chancellor. Big, big congratulations, ma'am. Where? Okay, with the kind permission of the President and Vice Chancellor, we have a little presentation for our Chancellor.
we want to very warmly, very respectfully invite our mama, our chancellor to step forward to cut her cake, the gorgeous cake. Good afternoon, everyone. It's so exciting to be here to celebrate the Chancellor of the Benson Idahosa University, who has many hats, and <laughs> my own mother. Mommy, we love you and we celebrate you. And on behalf of the Benson Idahosa University, we want to celebrate you, give you 80 elegant cheers. I would like you to walk majestically to cut your 80th birthday cake as an icon, as an enigma, as a woman who is a trailblazer. We'd like you to just put your hand on the knife and we are going to count to 80. Not exactly. We'll just spell 80 and we'll be there. E I G H C Y A T Happy birthday! We like to call. We like to call. Okay, she's here. I was looking for the vice chancellor to join in the pictures and the management staff to join in the pictures. Over to you, sir. Happy birthday to you, mom. Thank you very much. Happy birthday. We are going to celebrate you, like we said. 90, 100, 120 in Jesus' name. Thank you all very much. On behalf of the president and the vice chancellor, I'd like to very specially thank you all for being here. Thank you for taking the time to celebrate our chancellor with us. Thank you for taking the time to celebrate our Chancellor with us. We'd like to also remind you that the activities for further celebration of the Chancellor's 80th birthday will continue. Please join us as we continue to celebrate our Chancellor. The CGMI Megacom will commence on Monday. Please do well to participate. Thank you very much. And as you return to your respective destinations, we pray that God will take you home safely and in peace in Jesus' name. Okay. Yeah. Mama said they should share the cake for everyone. Please share the cake. Thank you very much. I'd like to, at this juncture, invite to the podium the president of Bensi Dahosa University and head of cabinet, Church of God Mission International, Right Reverend Dr. Feb Idahosa for the closing prayer. Please, round of applause for the president. Praise the Lord. I want to thank all of you who have been here today. And as we said at the beginning, thank you for being here to honor our chancellor, honor our mother. 
And in the same way you have been here to give honor to her, we're praying that God also shall bring honor to you as well in Jesus' name. May God add honor to your lives in Jesus' name. May God give you length of life and quality of life as has given to our Chancellor. May all that you do be blessed by God. And may your life truly be a testimony like hers has been in the name of Jesus. Shall we pray? Father, I thank you for today. We thank you for a chance to celebrate with our Chancellor. We thank you, Lord God, for the blessing that she has been to so many of us, for the blessings that we know and the ones we don't even know about. We thank you for that today, Lord God. We thank you for this great lecture that has come to celebrate her breaking and shattering glass ceilings. And we ask that, Lord God, everyone here as well will do the same in the name of Jesus. As we step forth from here today, we pray that your blessings go with us. Your grace be and continues to stand with us in all that we do. And that we will be the foundation upon which great things are built in the name of Jesus. We ask that you bless these hands that are here today lifted to your name. That they will leave here as blessings to the world. In the same way our chancellor has been a blessing, Lord God, may each one here be a blessing and touch lives for generations to come. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, we pray. Amen. God bless you. God keep you. Please, for everyone who has been invited for the cocktail with the Chancellor, it's taking place here. The entrance is right there. Only those with their invites, please. Bessie Dahosa University Staff Choir. If you have the the ticket with you, you um, Dr. Mr. Semota is on my extreme left, and she will give you direction to the venue of the cocktail. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Let's go. Enough. My worship is more than just a song. You love me more than I deserve, more than I deserve. Oh. I'll praise you till the end of days. I'll raise you, sing and shout your name. More than I deserve, more than I deserve. My praise will never be enough. My praise will never be enough. My worship is more than I deserve. You love me, you love me more than I deserve.